So I was with a, my friend Patty, and we were sitting at a table um, with uh, some, a, a couple guys that we worked with, but there were a bunch of Marines in there from Iwakuni, I remember. And, um, and they were getting drunk, and sometimes re Marines and sailors fight. <laughs> And I, I could feel tension. And in Club Alliance, they had their own shore patrol, separate from the main gate shore patrol on the base. And I knew just about everybody. And uh, I said, well, you know, I'm going to go talk to them because some comments are being made. And, and uh, you, you could just, you could just kind of tell something was going to go on. So anyway, I stood up to go to the door. And just as I'm reaching for it, this Marine grabs me. And I said, inappropriately. <laughs> Anyway, I turn around and without even thinking, with my right arm, come around and up and cracked him in the nose. I broke his nose. Um, <laughs> then everybody started fighting. <laughs> well, at this point, if I Shore Patrol had come in and taken me into the, to the shore just to sit there. If I had kept my mouth shut and sat there and be calm, nothing would have happened to me. But oh no. Well, oh, it, during my military career and even to this day, because my last name is O'Brien, I was called Obi. So, um, so anyway, the shore patrol, oh, just sit here, just, just be quiet. No, 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 I want to go back in. I want to see what's going on. <laughs> so I go back in and I get a little bit disruptive. So they decide, okay, they're going to take me to main, main shore patrol and, and handcuff me. And so I'm at main shore patrol and they got the, the desk uh, petty officer or chief is up, sits kind of higher than you. And, um, I'm kind of watching the commotion and people coming in and out. What's going on? What's going on? I want to be there. So again, I decided I'm not going to, well, there wasn't anybody really paying attention to me. So I bolt out the door to the main intersection and two of the Marines guards <laughs> tackle me in the street. So then I'm sent back and they said, oh, you're going to be restricted to the barracks because I lived out in town. I said, oh, great. So go over to the barracks, and my friend Patty, she, she, at that time she was back in the barracks. She, what happened, what did you do? I said, I don't wanna talk about it. So it was about, I guess, one, two o'clock in the morning. Well, on base, the chief's, the chief's barracks, they had their own bar and kind of like club. I said, let's go over to the chief's barracks. She said, well, are you, are you restricted to the, to the base or to the bar, uh, to the base? I, I said, to the base, I just have to be on the base. So we go over there, finish, finish partying. Well, I ended up having to go to Captain's Mass. I remember my skipper was so cool. Um, now, the Marine that I hit, his colonel <laughs> wanted him to take me to Mass for hitting him. <laughs> so he was there, nose is bandaged up, you know. Didn't want to be there, was embarrassed. Um, so my skipper, <laughs> Petty Officer O'Brien, I've never seen one woman cause so much problems in one night in all my life. <laughs> but I got a fine and a uh, six month suspended bust. And what that is, is if you don't mess up, you get to keep your crow, which I don't know. I'm, if you're not if you're not Navy, uh, we have a tradition when you become a petty officer and you get a crow, it's tacked on, boom, 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 until everybody and your arm is so bruised and you can't move it. And but it's worthwhile <laughs> again because you want that crow so bad. Um, so there were bets all over the place that I wasn't going to make it six months, <laughs> but I did, I did. Um, then, um, I'm trying to think, uh, gosh, I had, I had, oh, I decided, I said, uh, I, I'm a third class on my income. In Japan at that time, yen was 360 to a dollar, which is really great. I don't know what it is now. It's probably nothing. Um, 
and everybody was at the exchange buying stereos and um, speakers and reel to reels and re just everything. Um, our apartment building, <laughs> I lived really jammed. It was mostly, you know, um, uh, people from the base, young people from the base. Anyway, so three years there. Oh, I, I decided <clears throat> I'm going to get a car. I got a pay raise. So I went and got this small white Toyota, and everybody that I worked with, oh, we don't get a car. You drink too much. You're, something's going to. Please, you know, don't, you don't, you don't need a car. They have taxis. You can take a train. No, no, I'm going to buy a car. And I, I had never driven on the other side of the road before, or they're kind of traffic. And you really, they have trains, they have buses, they have taxis. Everything was cheap. Well, I went to the, I, they, and then they, again, they had bets <laughs> how long I would have it. And it was like two weeks to the day I had been in the club partying, starting about 11, I don't know, probably about, 10 at 11 at night, I decide I'm going to the beach. So I'm driving, driving pretty fast. Again, in Japan, you don't drink and drive because you can go to prison because they consider you're crazy or something is really wrong with you to do that. So I remember I was going through this tunnel pretty fast and I decided I, right before I went in, I was passing somebody. Oh, there was a car coming right towards me in the other lane. And I veered off, hit a cement telephone pole. The doors popped. I went flying out the car. Oops. <laughs> um, I was lucky. Uh, some Americans lived close by and and heard you know heard heard the accident and came up. To, and uh, they called the base. So the the base got me before the JNs, the Japanese police. Uh, I remember. <laughs> I hurt my back pretty bad. I was in a body cast for a while, and uh, uh, this was funny. Um, well, at, in the hospital, you know, everybody came to visit. They made fun of me. I had a car that uh, I had to pay for. Uh, I had to pay on a car for two years that I didn't have, or three years that I didn't have. <laughs> um, so I couldn't wear. It. That time they didn't have uniforms for. Uh, women who were pregnant, you know, big, because you couldn't stay in. You, you, they made you get out back then. And so I, I, had, I went to, had to get the men's largest shirt to go over this body cast around me. And it was August. And again, no central air conditioning either. <laughs> I'm sitting there on my floor in my uh, living room, and Japanese spaces are pretty small, so your kitchen, your living room, your bed, everything's right there. Um, I decide I don't need this cast anymore. So I get a screwdriver and a hammer and I'm banging on it all around trying to get it up, break it, and the, the uh, cast material is going all over the place. But this time Patty comes walking the door. She goes, oh, well, what the hell are you doing? I said, I don't want to wear this anymore. She goes, did you ever think about getting in the shower, getting it wet and breaking it apart? I said, no, I didn't think about that. She said, besides, she said, taking that off is, is going against a direct order, basically. I said, she goes, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. I said, okay. I said, we got to go back to the base. Said, well, thank goodness I know a lot of people. I knew the corpsman, and they put another one on me. <laughs> oh, I know. It was the one incident um, at my command. Um, like I said, I didn't, I didn't like typing. Um, I didn't reading messages, everything that had to do with part of, just part of the rate that I was in. There was upstairs was called technical control. And they thought they were so elite and walked on water and nobody was going to go behind their cipher lock to their door to get into their spaces. Well, I wanted in. And oh, there was such resistance, I'll never forget. I fought and fought. And then uh, finally, finally, I was the first woman uh, in Japan in te technical control. Now, that's where your crypto material, crypto equipment, your material, where you uh, make uh, the actual um, connections to be able for the ship shore between the transmitter and receiver sites. And then at the other end of the building is your secure voice and your Audubon. And so I got to be an operator there and um, I just love that aspect of my job and that's basically what I stayed with, um, the technical end. 
Um, but one of, one of the things that happened, I was the first woman in Westpac up on HICOM. It's a uh, high frequency um, ship voice, ship shore, uh, where you talk to the ships and, and if there's problem, you, you can do message traffic if you have to, if it comes down to that. And you have to do radio checks every hour. And every station, Japan, the Philippines, where Asia has a call sign, and ours was NP NPN. And um, so you also have a name. And in Japan back then it was called Backlash. So you go out on the net, uh, overwork, overwork, it says Backlash, Backlash. Testing for transmitter, receive for alignment. One, two, three, four, five, on up and back down. Well, one, one evening, the, the, the guy that was working the door, the gate, you know, we're checking your passes and stuff like that, calls up to me and he says, hey, Obi, these, these guys came in off the Blue Ridge, one of the ships, and uh, they said, uh, they asked me who was the woman that was up on HICOM, and, and I told him, I said, well, she's on watch right now. So he said, they want you to go over to the club which just happened to be next door to the comm stay, <laughs> was great making chow runs. <laughs> I always volunteered. So anyway, I go over there, and I walk in, and I see a group of them sitting at a table. So as I get close to the table, they start throwing money down on the table. I said, what's this all about? Oh, we had bets on what you look like all the way over here. <laughs> I, said, I said, I don't care who's buying. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Well, I, I left Japan. I went to uh, the, the Philippines. I put in for it. Again, when I got there, there was, I think, seven of us when I got there. And um, so much different than Japan. Kind of like Japan, but so much more different. Uh, so much uh, cost, of, it's so cheap to live there. Everything is cheap. One of the things um, I was able, as a uh, third class and then making second class, I lived off base. I had a three bedroom house. I, my second running mate that I met, her name was Nancy too. And um, we ended up getting a three bedroom house. We had a live in, a housekeeper, a yard boy, a seamstress. They have motorcycles with trikes on the side of them. Um, the, the guy, he knew my, my watch schedule and um, picked me up, take me to the base. We still had to maintain a room in the barracks. Um, but that was cool because we still, we had people that cleaned the barracks, did your laundry, did your uniform, shined your shoes, did everything. <laughs> I was so spoiled. I, I, I was like being rich, I guess. <laughs> and I still was broke on paydays. <laughs> um, when I got there, I, they sent me to work at the receiver site, which was a couple miles off base. Um, and we used to have to get in a truck, everybody that was on watch, and drive down the two-mile access road to get to the receiver site. I, I liked it. Um, it wasn't in the message center doing all the message traffic and everything. We just basically cut the receivers, receivers up. Again, when I say receivers, it's for the ship shore communication. Um, I remember we got stranded out there one time during a monsoon. Uh, that they couldn't even get anything to the base. The ships from Subic for supply. They had to bring supplies from Subic on a ship to the back of the base because uh, the roads were all washed out. Um, but we ended up, the antenna fields to the receiver got filled above the access road. So we were kind of stuck out there for a few days. And thankfully they had MREs, which were not real great, but it was something to eat. And, uh, and we're sleeping. Use burn bags. Burn bags are you put all your, your trash message or papers and you fill classified material. You fill up these bags because they have to be destroyed in a certain procedure. But if you stack them up real good, it's a good place to sleep. And then you get a foul weather jacket to keep you warm. Um, I also, when I was there, uh, was sent to, uh, or they wanted me to work in what is called the Human Goals Office. This was my beginning of, of affirmative action.